All right. Hello, uh, Facebook uh, Live, uh, YouTube, Craigslist, whoever, wherever you're watching, whoever's watching. Um, I'm very excited. Right now we have uh, <laughs> Craigslist. <laughs> at each other. But, uh, you know, I have hopes someday this is going to become a, a famous podcast. And I can say I, I had Keith Ross Nelson when he would still uh, when he was still accessible before he. <laughs> You know, before he just entered that, that, that realm of, uh, you know, talk to my assistant, to my press agent, to my social media advisor, to my uh, manager's uh, chief of staff. So, but right now we've got him today. I'm very excited. Welcome to How Does That Happen? This is episode 15. I'm just breaking records. 15 in, in one year, Keith. So you can tell. Oh, nice. I'm very prolific. Uh, I don't think I've even posted 14 of them yet. But uh, uh, How Does That Happen is a podcast about unusual record holders uh, should be record holders, want to be record holders. So we have a, a lot of, we do some should be's, but we have an actual record holder here today. Uh, very excited to have him on the show. Uh, good friend, comedian, actor, uh, martial artist, uh, athlete, uh, father, husband, man about town. Uh, please welcome to episode 15, the very funny Keith Ross Nelson. Thank you. Yeah, have me on before my managers or agents, I'm unavailable or pass away, whichever of the two happened first. <laughs> he's, he's COVID unavailable. I've been joking. Uh, Mike, Mike, I'm having so much problem getting attention in my career. COVID won't even touch me right now. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> this is awesome today because usually... <laughs> That's actually the best COVID line I've heard so far. <laughs> you you got to open with that once you open once it opens up. You got to open with that because the audience will be so on your side because you know they're all scared of COVID, and then to make yourself the butt of a joke like that right off the bat, they're going to be rooting for you. Well, real jump, real quick, we jump to COVID, then we'll jump back because then you've got a lot to talk about, but. What happens now? Where they're working on a vaccine. When the vaccine does come, uh, some are going to take it, some aren't going to take it. Then what happens with the mask? Everyone's all the not on anti-maskers like, oh, I already have my vaccine. I don't have to wear a mask. But there's going to be God. wear a big lapel, you know, a lanyard that says I, I've been shot. You know, I've been vaccinated. How does? You know, oh God, I know. Are we going to do? Do we get the little star on our left arm by the? Oh yeah, you get a fast. Yeah, the fastest, a, the fastest regime. Jeez, yeah, it makes us want, you know, just it's the it's just nice to even have these uh, discussions, just to talk to someone saying, just talk to anyone really right now. It's the only reason I even do this podcast is just so uh, I can get my friends to actually uh, talk to me because I know uh, we're all just trying to get through this COVID thing. Uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, just browsing my Facebook feed and I saw you had a, a, a profile article from New York Weekly. So I jumped in there, and and I knew a little bit about your background, but I really didn't know how much uh, you've accomplished. I'm not trying to, you know, get get you all uh, embarrassed or you, but uh, tell you rather than me reading your your bio, give, give our uh, listeners the Keith Ross Nelson bio, brief Keith Ross Nelson bio, or uh, Keith Ross Nelson, or as long as you want to go, I don't care. Oh well, I guess the uh, the high jump now it's former because the record got broken. It was an age group record I broke uh, May 20th, uh, 2000, which, and the age group was, I just turned 45, so the record was uh, in the high jump. Uh, and uh, it was an interesting day because uh, it was in Visalia and it was 110 degrees. It was like it's the weather right now. So, uh, and it's weird because you get, I got up and I kind of, I said, this is the day. I felt really good, and uh, I actually didn't have a miss until I I broke the record, and then I hadn't had a miss till the next height. So I went six feet, six two, six four, six six, got the record, and then didn't have a miss till six seven and a quarter. Uh, which so anyway, it was yeah. So I I got an age I got an age group record, and then it lasted till. 2007 so seven years it had a good run okay so you you, you what was your final uh what was the record which six you, six age six, group seven. 40 because it went in masters it goes five-year increments so 
like you start masters at 30, then it's 30 to 34, 35 to 39, 40 to 44, 45 to, and it goes like that. So it's when you set a record, it's in an age group and it's a five year, five years, you could set the record in that age group. Then you move uh, to the next age group. 49 year olds, like all pissed off. Look at this young guy coming in here and showing us up. Yeah. It's that's funny. You should say that because the joke end is you, you always want to get in your best shape right before you turn the next stage. And then you want to try to get the record right as you turn that age, because that's why you're, because st- of course, once you start getting older, you know, when you're young, the idea is to peak, you're climbing this hill and then you peak. But when you get old, then the idea is you're at the top of the hill. You've already peaked. Now you're just digging your heels in as you go down the hill, trying not to, you know, you lose your strength, you lose your speed. So now it's a battle against yourself, you know, because you start losing, you know, things. So. Right. You know, you, your mental, your mental acuity can be probably stronger than ever. And the body may not, uh, you know, the muscles and the nerves uh, aren't, aren't in, in alignment. You know, it's crazy. It's funny you should say that because I always tell people like when you run, when you turn 30 each year after that, you lose 1% of your oxygen intake. So for instance, like whatever you're doing at 30, let's say you're doing five miles, you go out and run. When you do that at 40, 10% less oxygen to your lungs. Wow. That, that's one of the bad things about COVID is even if you recover, uh, a lot of people are losing up to 30% of their oxygen now uh, in the bottom of their lungs. So, Imagine if you're 25 or 30 and, and you get COVID. 25 or 30 and, year old. Yeah. Right. And then you recover. Well, not the invalid 25, 30 year olds. Shut in. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you recover, but you lost 30% of your oxygen intake. You go out to work out. You're breathing like a 60 year old man. That's some pretty serious uh, after effects, as they say. And when you're 60, you're breathing like you're a 90 year old man. Yeah. There you go. That would be even worse. The tsunami of health issues after the the vaccine and the recovery takes place. It's it's uh, it's going to be uh, um, you know I'm sociologically altering. I I believe you know. I mean, we think about that. And, and there's another one that that they they've discovered. You have a lot more. Uh, uh, they're having a lot more cases of people with blood clots. So I mean. I don't know if I've had it and it had it that it's already gone. I don't think I have, but as soon as I heard that, I go, okay, I'm taking a baby aspirin every day. So mm-hmm. now when it, whenever I run right before I run, I take a baby aspirin because I'm keeping those pipes clean. I'm not taking any chances. Good for you. So uh, are, yeah. you, are you a daily runner? No, I do. Here's my skills is kind of weird. I do like, um, like today's schedule is I'm going to, I'll do sprints. Then tonight I got Kung Fu class. Tomorrow I'll get up and just do Kung Fu forms for about 30, 35 minutes. Thursday will be weightlifting. Friday would be Kung Fu forms again. Then Saturday would be running. So every other day I either run or lift weights. And then on the days in between, I do Kung Fu forms. Now, how bad, my, how bad has COVID affected your, your workout regimen? It hasn't affected it at all. I just, I go out and do it. I, I never wear a mask when I run, obviously. Well, how's so, the smoke right now where you're at? How's the what? How's the smoke from fires? You, guys, you, you know, it's funny because I haven't, I ran, God, what did I do? I ran Wednesday. Today's a run day. So I don't know. I'm going right after I do this, I'm going out to run. But if it's really bad. I may, I may lift weights weights today and just skip running for two more days. Stay in. Yeah, I just may. I may just. Sometimes you got to make an adjustment. You know. You okay. know. I mean, I had to make an adjustment on my lifting because they closed all the gyms. So then, uh, it was crazy. All I had in my house was a thirty-five pound dumbbell. So I was doing sets of thirty with front squats with a dumbbell because I would just do a lot of reps. Mm -hmm. um and then i bought some weights but they that took a month to get here and then right when the weights got here they opened the gyms again so i was like oh cool so i was back in the gym 
That lasted for a month. Then they closed it down. And then now they got some gyms that are open outside, which is great, except you go to work out and it's 100 degrees. Yeah, you got to go at four in the morning. Oh, dude. I went the other day at 10 and it was already over 100. And I laid down on the bench and I went to grab and I had my gloves on. And I went to grab the bar and I go, holy shit, that's not happening. Oh, <laughs> the bar, it was you're, like, it was, uh, you're in the West Valley, right? You're in the LA area. Yeah. Chatsworth. Chatsworth, 121 in Woodland Hills. Yeah. Dude. And I'm right next to Woodland Hills. I don't, I don't heat my toast up that much. <laughs> I said to my friend the other day, I was at Walmart and this is a joke, but it, it was, it's kind of have to, I was getting in my car and there was a guy loading his stuff into the car with a baby you know, in a stroller. And I heard the baby, uh, the parents got excited because the baby had said her first words, but it was actually a whole sentence that says, fuck, get me out of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll come back to the athletic records because I want to discuss your, your, your uh, black belt uh, accomplishments, your high jump uh, record that lasted for uh, seven years in your age group. But uh, are, you, are you still writing a lot of comedy during uh, COVID? Yeah, ready? that's all I've been do do that's all I've been doing. Workouts. Right. Yeah. Good. So yeah. And then, our special when we're done with this COVID thing. Um well, I, what's that? I'm sorry. I so say you're gonna have a whole hour special from uh, Well, I don't know about that, but I would say so far at least twenty since March, maybe thirty. Cause it's I just been and that you know, I write them down. Then you reword them, and then if they look good, then you move them to the three by five cards. What's your What's your mindset on writing? Do you do it as it comes? Do you have a set schedule to write? You know, it's so funny, dude. When the COVID first hit, I said, "Okay, I'm going to do an hour every day, an hour and a half," and I was doing that for about two months. And I don't know what happened. Maybe Maybe it was depression. I don't know. I just didn't give a shit for a while. And I've kind of been in that mode for about a month and a half, but I've still been writing jokes, but it's been like more hit and miss. I think right. I just got burned out. So I took some time, but I'm getting ready to start. I said to my, I was, my kid and I were talking about yesterday and I said, I think I'm going to go get an egg timer, you know, and then turn the egg timer on because it's kind of like Kung Fu. You got to, uh, I said the egg timer, it's going to force me to do it. Cause it's like, now you're on a timer, you have to do it. So it's yeah. kind of like, cause I was like, I got to get back into making that a thing, just like doing forms or working out. Mm -hmm. Cause there's like, I, I go through these stages every once in a while where it's like, you know, like I wrote it, I wrote two TV pilots and then I'm halfway through a movie right now. And then it's just. Okay. So the TV pilots you've written during COVID. Uh, actually I finished both of those. No, I finished one. And then the other one, I was halfway done. I finished it about a month ago. So now I'm, I don't like to do the pitch packs. You got to do this pitch pack thing, which I hate. So, yeah. So I have a guy working on, uh, he's supposed to be talking to his friend. I'm going to pay him to do the pitch packs because I don't want anything to do with him. Well, it's been great talking to you, Keith. World record holder. Uh, prolific joke writer, screenwriter. I've been humiliated enough, so thank you, guys. <laughs> it's <laughs> awesome. I, yeah. It, uh, what time do you wake up? Like three? Uh, <laughs> actually, I get up about eight. So the day starts with the litter boxes. So I always say my dark, my day starts off with shit. So it's all downhill after that. Let me interrupt you real quick. So we talked before the show. Uh, since this is a show about unusual record holders, you may be the comedian. Uh, not only with the uh, master's high jump record for, that stood for seven years, third degree black belt, also may have the most cats in the history uh, of uh, stand up comedy. How many? Uh, how many there's, cats? There's 24 inside. Hold on here. I'll give you. A... I think Say I saw, hi, Bo. I think I saw two spinning on the fan. Yeah. There's okay. That was that's Bo. He's always as soon as I sit down, he wants we call him Bo Jackson because he's really strong. Um, yeah, we got 24 inside and then we've got, I think 10 outside we're feeding. Actually, it's more cause this one cat just had kittens. I'm trying to trap her 
and get her in the house and get her fit. She's the last cat outside that needs to be fixed. He's pretty uh, elusive, huh? Oh, dude. She had four kittens, and then we tried to get her, and we were we didn't get her. And then she now she's got four more. So it's like this has got to at some point stop. It took me a year to trap the other ten outside. You know, trap them and then take them to Fix Nation and then bring them home. And the others are watching. You know, they're saying, "Okay, I see what this guy's up to. I'm not." Following- <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Oh. I become like ice outside. <laughs> I'm, I always, my wife, whenever anything's wrong with them, she makes me take them to the vet. What so of course, when outside cats get to the vet. They must be just bouncing off the wall. The no, no, no. The the inside cats. But oh, she. We've had one that was outside that had a messed up eye, and she made me catch it and take it to the vet. So it's just oh, your arms were like covered in like uh, claw marks or um, no, I don't get clawed too often. I got we have one, our biggest cat indoors. He's like twenty eight pounds, and his claws, I mean, literally are almost as big yeah, as my hands. Yeah, he's like, a beast. That's like a second grader, dude. Dude, he's like a he's like a little kid, and he scratched me once on my finger, and then it got infected. And it felt like a broken finger for a week. It hurt so bad. Couldn't even bend my finger. Did you go to the doctor? No, I just, I, I, I kept cleaning it every day. Yeah. And then I said, okay, if it gets any worse, then I'm going. And then I was just about ready to go to the doctor. And then it turned around and was fine. Did you get the but, fever uh, feeling like fluey on top of having the bed? No, no, no. I just, I, so... I guess I probably dodged a bullet. Yeah, could have lost the thing. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, okay, so we got to we got to work our way back. So your your record is uh, uh, in high jump and a master's forty five to fifty forty five forty nine age group set back in two thousand one. You said or two thousand? Yeah, I think if if you went to masters records, I think it would still. I'm still probably top five all time. So you started on the list. Uh, track and field um, high school, I'm guessing? Uh, I think my first year I jumped was either sixth or seventh grade. Yeah, middle school. Are you it was, old? It was this is five. how crazy. It was like, yeah, I'm, I, I Western rolled. Western rolled. Till, okay. till I was a junior. And well, then my junior, right? Yeah, my junior year, I went six five. And then halfway through my junior year, I switched to going backwards and went 6'5". And then I went 6'5 and three quarters in high school. And then I, you know, slowly worked my way to 7'4 and a quarter in my 20s. Wait, wait, what? what? Yeah. Seven, you went 7'4"? Yeah, 7'4 and a quarter is my best job. Are you? Sh- that's unbelievable. Yeah. That's world class right there. Mm-hmm. I never got over 5'10". Yeah, five ten's a good jump. I couldn't even jump my height. I'm six one. Yeah, no, yeah. Know. Five five ten's not a bad high school jump. What was your was was track and field your main sport growing up, or were you more uh, partial? Um, well, high school I played f- football, basketball, and track. Then college I played track, and where'd then when I got out of, huh? Where'd you go to college? I went University of Oregon. And then I transferred because I got tired of jumping in the rain um, and transferred to San Jose State. Uh, and at that time, Oregon was ranked number two in Division One, and San Jose was State was ranked fourth. In wow. fact, my senior year, we went up to Oregon and blew them off the track on the Hayward. What's that? Competed against all your old teammates. Yeah, and we blew them off the track, which was very rewarding to do. Yeah. Dude, and it was great, of course, because they get track fans there. There was like 15,000 people that track me because Eugene's <laughs> like the track capital of the United States. A lot of people don't realize how huge track is there, how huge it was back in you know, in the 70s. That was, you know, that was... Uh, yeah. You would, it would always be on TV. You'd have track and field champions. Oh, it was crazy. Yeah. You know, I jumped my sophomore year in the last meet that uh, Prefontaine ran it. 
wow. uh, on a Saturday. Yeah, it was Saturday, and I think it was the last week of May. And then that night he got in a car crash. So I jumped. He was in the meet, and then we woke up the next day, and then he was gone. Oh, geez, that had to be just- crazy. And here's the craziest story about that. My freshman year, he had just graduated. So he was running for the Oregon Track Club, I think. Uh, but he was still on campus. You know, he's running workouts every day. And he drove up to the track, and he had the ye- little yellow Triumph Spitfire, you know. Mm-hmm. And he gets out of the car, and I looked at him, and I go, hey, dude, you better get a roll bar for that. Because my dad, ironically, had the same kind of you car. Him and I, huh? You told him that or you were thinking? Yeah, I said, you should get a roll bar for that because if you ever roll that car, you're going to be screwed. And it, typical pre, he kind of looked at me and, you know, did that with his hand, ah, and walked away. And then like a year later, that's exactly what happened. Jeez. He was in that same triumph. He was in the same, that when he, when he rolled the car, he was in the same exact car. Hmm. Jeez. So, man, you little, were. Little, a little yellow triumph. MGB. And here's another interesting tidbit. I was one of the, only because I was there, not because I'm anything special or anything, but my freshman year, uh, Bowerman had just retired the track coach who invented, by the way, Nike with Phil Knight. And they, they were their first couple shoes, the first couple hundred they made, you know, they used to pour the rubber onto the waffle irons yeah. then they would when the, they, the rubber would cool they'd peel it off cut it out in the shape of the shoe size and put them on the bottom of shoes so the good news is i had one of the first 100 pairs of uh waffle shoes that nike had put out did you hang on to the that? Bad, huh did you hang on to it the bad news is of course you know you're a Dumbass 19 year old, 18 year old freshman, you don't know any better. You don't know this is going to be a big thing later on. So, of course, I I had the shoes for a couple of years actually, and then I lost them or something. So I always kick myself in the head because it would be would have been great to hold on to those shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, the closest thing I did for making up to that is I got a pair from Nike. Uh, cause I was still getting sponsored and getting stuff from them. I got a pair of 92, uh, Jordan Olympians that I still have. And I've never taken out of the box. Really? So they're probably yeah. worth, is there a shoe broker? You go on to, Hey, what are these worth? Is it like, yeah, you know? I'm guessing they're worth a probably a thousand to 1500 now. There you go. But I'm just going to keep them and then I'll will them to my grandsons and tell them to hold them on, hold on to them for another 40 years. And then they'll probably will be worth yeah, hundred a decent amount of money. Yeah. Wow. So you were, you were there, right? When you were pre Nike, dude, that was so awesome. Dude, dude the, I was there. I was there when you would go out from Hayward and Knight would be selling them out of the back of his car, the trunk of his car. He'd wow. have like 50, 75 pairs and he'd be selling them to people out of the trunk. Man, talk about a vision, huh? Yeah, and then you know what they did that was really smart? They were the first, at when they were trying to start out, uh, Puma, don't quote me on this, I can't remember, because it's it's either Puma was number one and Adidas was number two, oh, right. or Adidas was number one and Puma, but yeah. Puma and Adidas were one, two. Which one was one, I can't remember. But here's the interesting thing. The two guys that invented Puma and Adidas are brothers, and they're Germans, and they got in a fight, and they hated each other. So I think Adidas was first, and it's uh, named after the, the brothers are Adis or Adis, uh, you know, that's their name. Mm-hmm. And then they had a fight, so the other brother left and invented Puma, and they built the Puma factory right across the river Rhine from the brother. So the Puma and Adidas fra- factories yeah, were right across the river, like a F U to each other. That's awesome. So Nike the then came shoe. What's that? It was a spike shoe. Oh my God. It was totally a spike, not a spike shoe, but a spike shoe. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So then what happened when Nike came along, you know, they weren't even on the map. But they did something that was really smart. And this is what started all this stuff. 
they would go to sporting goods shows and go, I mean, sporting goods stores, and they would tell the guys in the stores, hey, if you put our shoes in the window and try to sell them for us, we'll give you free shoes. Mm -hmm. So the first free shoes didn't go to athletes, didn't go to the coaches. It went to like the Foot Locker employees and the yeah, sporting right. goods employees. Hey, and go. that's how Nike got the jump on Adidas and Puma. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, huh? Wow. <laughs> and then they went from that to uh, uh, the Jordan thing. And the J Jordan, I mean, if you saw The Last Dance, of course. Watching it now. Uh, yeah. I think it's in The Last Dance. I can't remember. But uh, Jordan got out of North Carolina, and he was all set to sign with Adidas. I mean, he was just gun ho I'm an Adidas guy, da 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 and Falk, David Falk, his agent, begged him, look, I really think this Nike thing's going to take off. And Jordan was like, nah. But then Jordan's moms talked him into flying out to Beaverton, Oregon. Yeah. Why don't you just go talk to him, show him the respect. And then he got there, and Nike sold him on it, and the rest is history. You know, The next thing they did was the Spike Lee thing. They took Jordan, who was the up-and-comer guy, with the young up-and-comer filmmaker, and they make those iconic commercials, and then it just blew up. Yeah. Talk about marketing genius, you know? Market, yeah. They, you know, some, my wife always says sometimes you're – sometimes just things are destiny. She, has a, she really feels like that, and that's kind of like, I think, what happened to Nike. I think some of it was uh, – I don't even think it was genius. I think they tried something different and it worked, you know, and the different, the tried something different was the first thing was putting the shoes in the window mm. because nobody had really ever done that, you know, and then wait, 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 get, in the window before they just threw whoever. No, I didn't mean that. I shouldn't say that. I yeah. think the genius yeah. was, I think, I think Adidas and Puma were in the window, but to get, but giving the shoes to the employees so they would put a brand new shoe in the window right alongside the Adidas and Puma, that was genius. Yeah. You know, because that's the saying, you know, if you want something from somebody, give them something first. Don't ask them for something. And because once you give them something, then you can ask them for something. Yep. There you go, folks. Life hack from uh, Keith Ross Nelson. It's, yeah, that's yeah. like a, that's, you know, that's, that's funny. You should bring that up because that's one of the rules in, uh, there's a great book. It's my favorite book besides the Bible. It's called the 48 laws of power. That's one of the rules. If you want something, uh, give before you take mm -hmm. one of the 48 rules. 48 laws. Of, what is it? 48 laws of power. Yeah. 48 laws of power. It's, I think the guy's name that wrote it is Robert Klein. He's a professor from Yale. It's mm -hmm. a fantastic, I've read the book so many times now I have it taped together because I read it once a year. Did you just read it early back in your, your high school, college days? Did this no, I got this book probably. It's crazy. I got this book right after I married my wife. Now that I'm married to, and I was like one of those things. The crazy thing is my wife was in politics in the Philippines. And uh, she was the youngest vice governor in the history of the Philippines. And then she was the head writer in the Senate when Aquino was president in the 90s. She was actually on track to probably run for president. Wow. And then, you know, her marriage blew up with her first husband. Uh, and she moved here and then she ended up being married to me. So you can see how she was on an ascent. And then so this is some sort of witness protection program. Now she's, yeah, now she's with me in, a, in the witness protection program. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're on pace to be president of a country and now you're with a comedian. <laughs> hey, if I jumped a uh, seven, four, and four, right? <laughs> what kind of wrong turn did she make in life? Okay. But anyway, she, uh, when I got that book, you know, I was reading it, you know, when I would do something that kind of broke one of the rules, cause you know, lose my temper or whatever, you know, she'd always go, wow, 
I guess you need to read that book again because you still haven't learned you. You know, just giving me shit all the time because she knows all the rules. She follows all the rules. Her and her daughter, I've never met two women in my life that follow all those rules better than them. So anything good I've learned in life is in the last 10, 13 years being married to her and hanging around my daughter. Mm. 48 rules. I could, I, I'd have trouble remembering four. And that's yeah. It. Well, you know what? It's funny you should say that because there's probably 10. Here's the great thing about the book. They give you a rule. Uh, like I think rule number one in the book is never outshine the master. And then they give you things in history of where a person followed that rule. And then they give you a thing in history where the person didn't follow the rule and what the repercussions were. And then at the end of the book, at the end of each chapter, they gave you a reversal to the rule, like the reversal for uh, never outshine the master. The reversal is you can outshine the master if they're on their way out or they're, they're about to crash. Mm. But here's the interesting thing. I think there's five to 10 rules in the book and those rules have no reversals. The reversal is if you break this rule, you do so at your own peril. Like one of the rules is don't hang around infectious people. And then you get to the end of that chapter and the reversal, it says there is no reversal. If you hang around infectious people, they'll eventually infect you, infect you and take you down. Mm. Wow. And now what, yeah. when was this book written? Probably early 2000s, really? late 18. Yeah, it's better. This is how good this book is. I think it's better than Art of War by Sun Tzu. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, now I got it. I got a uh, book. Yeah, there. dude, you, you, you would love that book. You, you'll be reading it and going, wow, I'm glad Keith told me about this book. Mm. Yeah. And the great thing about you, you'll you'll actually, I would say you're probably already uh, following at least half the rules anyway, just because you're kind of a good doing it, a chill dude. So you probably are just by accident following most of the rules. Yeah, most of the stuff I do in my life, unfortunately, is by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really mean by accident that yeah, kind of yeah. like, that was a dumbass thing that was a dumbass thing to say I mean you kind of have I don't know I don't know how to describe it the, uh, Jordan said it you have that thing uh, the, the best thing about the last dance is the last episode this won't spoil it for you but it was the best thing it was like wow this makes wor it worth. I mean, I love all 10 episodes. It was great. I've, I'm probably going to watch it again. I've already watched it three times. Mm -hmm. But at the end, they said, what's, they asked Jordan some kind of a question. What's the best thing about you? And he goes, I was always, a, 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 I was always a, uh, able to be in the moment. I was never 10 minutes ahead or 10 minutes behind. I was always just be in that moment. And I said, that's a really good thing. Just yeah. be right in that moment. Don't worry about 10 minutes from now or 10 minutes before. Just be present. Yep. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, yeah. If you get one thing, really, if you, if you can only remember one, you can't remember the 48 laws of power. Yeah. Be present. Boy. So that yeah. was the Jordan thing I got from him because he said, I was always able to just focus and be in the moment. What do you think? And He's you been caught up in the whole, uh, the stuff with his dad and the stuff with Jerry Krause and the fact the team was imploding. Yeah. All this, it was all coming to an end. You know, a lot of people, that's a that's a tremendous uh, mental burden. Yeah. yeah. And he just, he just like, you know what? I can have no control over that, but I have control how, how I play tonight, you know, and focusing on that moment. And the, uh, it was really good because uh, – when I heard that, I go, that's what you do in Kung Fu, you, you know, fighting. You don't get mad. You don't tense up. You stay relaxed and just be in the moment, mm -hmm. you know, and focus. Focus is like the most important thing, you know, and probably in martial arts. Now, in, in, in a Kung Fu practice, uh, for those of you who uh, might have just jumped in or haven't had a chance to uh, hear about Keith's story, he's uh, not only a, a, a 
a world class uh, high jumper from uh, from the day, and is a, is a young man ad in the masters division 45, 49. He also has a third degree black belt. Am I right? Yeah, third degree. So, how many years of study in the martial arts? I'm now at uh, 10, 10 and a half. I thought you were going to say 25, 30 years to be yeah. a third degree. So you just you just dove in. Had- well, I don't know about that. We at our school, you can you can get to black in three years. You have to go to, I think, seventy percent of the classes, and then you have to know a certain. It, it's kind of like you can you can progress on how fast you want to progress kind of, but you can't, there is limits. Like you can't, the fastest you can get to red belt is two and a half years. And uh, I'm sorry, two years. And then the fastest you can get to black is three, but you can take longer. I mean, when I went in, in 2010, uh, my thing was, I want to get black belt, but I was like, in my head, I was like, how am I going to do this? That it seemed like impossible. I go, okay, I'm just going to go to class. I mean, I wanted to get to black belt, but I thought, okay, let's just go to class and see how I do. And then I just kept showing up. And when I honestly, go ahead. Uh, Back up. So you're, you're 52 at the time, 53. Yeah, I was, uh, 54. Yeah. It inspired you to say, Hey, I'm, you know, I, I think uh, because you know what I'd wanted to do it since I was 20 and you know what, uh, because of doing other stuff. And then, you know how it is. Sometimes you just make excuses. I thought to myself one day I was like, here's what's crazy. One day I said, you know what? I need to quit making excuses about this and bullshitting around and just do it. Cause at some point it's going to be, I'm going to be too old. So I started looking around online and then this one school had really high ratings and it was like, it was just luck. I called them up and I liked the lady on the phone and she's actually the wife of the husband that runs the school. And she's the highest ranked woman, I think in Kung Fu in the world. I think she's seventh or eighth degree. She's a master. Her husband that runs the school, Master Baird, He's a premier grandmaster. I mean, mm-hmm. grandmaster, I, I didn't even know there was such a thing as premier grandmaster. Wow. Uh, because if you get to grandmaster, I mean, that's just way off the food chain. Yeah, uh, and, but he's a, yeah, and plus, you, have, you and I, if we go into a class, we have the luxury of being taught by someone over us and, and constantly be able to take class. A guy at that level, he can't just go to... China, or Korea, Japan, where you know, and, and train with someone above him. You know what I mean? The, yeah, he he's he's already team. the yeah. It's like he's like the Jordan of his thing. But there's no other it, no other NBA players to practice with. No, it's you know. it's he's the guy, and, and you know. So I got in there, and there's our school trains. We very rarely do anything fast. Everything's very slow, very deliberate. A lot of eye stuff. And it's, you go in there, and it's very chill. Uh, ten and a half years, I've never heard this guy raise his voice. I mean, you hear how I'm talking. He talks lower than me, very calm. His wife's Italian. She's a little more animated and stuff, but I've never heard her really lose her. T- I've never heard either of them lose their temper in almost 11 years. So how many years did it take you to get uh, from uh, walking in and checking out the school to your first black, first degree black? So uh, I got my black belt uh, in three, and then you have to wait at least two to get second degree. And I got that in uh, three. And then uh, I got the... uh, and then third degree, you have to wait another two years. That's the soonest you can get it. And I was doing a lot of comedy and bookings and stuff. So they they said I could test after two, but I, I didn't feel like it would be uh, respectful to the other people in the class because they were there most of the time and I was gone a lot. So I said, no, I'll just wait another year, which I'm glad I did. And so at nine, I got the third degree. So the next level uh, – Fourth is actually where you become a master. 
So now I'm having the battle of, uh, because basically to be a master at our school, you literally have to know everything in our uh, uh, program. And it's a, it's a lot. Like there's 30 forms you have to know, and I'm at 24. I'll get to the 30 forms. I'm not worried about that. The hop keto, there's 40 throws. Uh, that's my weakest uh, thing is hop keto. I, obviously, I'm a tall, thin guy. I don't like going to the ground. Um, and then uh, the animals, I already know all the animals. We have 20, 74 animals, and you got to know it's actually uh, 148 because you have to know them on both sides of your body. So I know all the animals. I need six more forms. It would be the hop keto I really got to work on. I'd have to go back and go to some of the beginning classes and just work on my hop keto because I hate hop keto. <laughs> I did hop keto for a few years, which you know it's just a little uh, less less uh, aggressive form of hop keto. Aggressive may not be the right word. But right. Me. Yeah, but uh, that was that was awesome. But my problem and now, I'm in that, and like I'm like I'm in my late fifties. I'm like the kneeling part to me is, is the killer. Oh, dude! Huh? I, you know, I have a joke. I just wrote in my act. I go, you know, you you the sign you're getting old is like I drop something on the ground. Now I look down at the ground. I go, you know, I can just stay there. There's there's no need to pick that up. I said, my wife rolled under the bed one time and she wanted me to get out. And I said, hey, you know what? You're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of being thrown on the ground or, you know, is like, I want to avoid that. <laughs> so how's your, uh, your high jumping uh, endeavors and your. Oh, those are done. How, how long? Yeah. So you're finished with that. But how, how is the high jumping over the back in the day? And the uh, Kung Fu helped you with comedy or, or uh, um, intertwined with it? You know, the, the high jumping, um, you know, the high jumping is really interesting because it helped comedy because, of course, you got to focus when you compete. But here's the most, the, the high jumping to Kung Fu thing actually helped me in Kung Fu being a high jumper before because when you high jump, you run towards the bar in a straight line and then you run on a curve the last five or six steps. Mm -hmm. And the thing that allows people to jump higher going backwards than, than the Western roll is the idea you go from a straight line to a curve and it's the centrifugal force that helps you throw you in the air, kind of like a car going around a corner too fast and then sliding mm -hmm. off the curve. And everything in Kung Fu is either a straight line to a curve or a curve to a straight line. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of centrifugal force involved because when you punch somebody, it actually comes from the bottom of your foot up through your body. So the first time I was in class and they said something about centrifugal force and straight line to a curve or curve to a straight line, I immediately understood because of the high jump. So that actually really helped me uh, yeah. at the beginning. At the beginning, yeah. From the feet, yeah. Yeah, and the Kung Fu, uh, the best thing about Kung Fu is, you know, you do those forms every day and they're monotonous and it takes 30 or 35 minutes and you do them over and over. And I remember one time, Master Bear, this was when I was like probably first degree brown belt or something. I probably knew 12 forms. And he had said in class, when you get to 20, 25 forms, then you'll know patience. And I thought to myself, that's a weird thing to say, right? And mm -hmm. now I'm at 24 forms and I go, oh, okay, I get it. Because when people do things, you know, that upset you, I still feel the, the bile and the anger come up inside me. And then, it, you know, how it kind of comes up to here and you're getting like mad. And then I'm like, ah. <laughs> and you just let it dissipate. It just yeah. goes away. So, and that's from doing the forms over and over and being patient. So between dealing with 24 fricking cats every day and litter boxes, that's the first hour of my day, then feeding the cats and then doing forms for 45 minutes. I get up at eight and by the time all that's done, it's already 11 o'clock. I've done some stuff that, you know, when you clean litter boxes every day, that's not a pleasant task, right? but it has to, but it has to be done. So it's just a task that has to be done, and it takes about 30, 40 minutes. 
and then you do the forms for 40 minutes, these are monotonous. It's monotonous shit to do every day. But it makes you enjoy your fun shit more too. You know, once you get that the, out. The, like, dude, I'm sitting on my bed now talking to you. I got three cats sitting on the end of the bed. Dude, they're all sleeping. They look very happy and content. That's a pretty nice feeling. Yeah, and it's thanks to you and your wife giving you a great home. Yeah. And these home? cats, dude, you know, these cats, it's amazing. I, I have another comedian friend. I won't say his name because I don't want to rag on anybody. But his two, he's got two cats, and they fight all the time, right? Well, of course, me being a dumbass, I was like, God, this his cats are so nasty, right? And my wife says to me some, one time, she goes, she goes, well, yeah, of course they're nasty cats. Him and his wife fight all the time. Wow. I go, the cats have assumed their their owner's personalities. And I was like, oh, my God, my wife is like, duh. Because We're these right. cats, yeah. dude, we have 24 cats. And for the most part, you know, they get up in the morning and sometimes there's a little bit of chasing each other and stuff because they got to re re. I don't even know how to say it. They reestablish their territorial boundaries, kind of. So maybe there's a little bit once in a while with one or two cats. And then once that's set, literally the rest of the day, they're chill. And cats are very territorial. They're not like, they really don't like to share their area with other cats. But my wife always says, it's because we're so loving and kind to each other and them in the house. They've assumed our personality. And I thought, wow, she's right. That's like really cool. Mm, man. So, yeah, cat, animals, man, have between Kung Fu and animals have taught me nothing but good stuff. Well, 24 cats inside, 10 outside. I'm guessing no dogs. No dogs. Yeah. It's funny you should say that because I keep debating myself about getting a dog here's the problem man i'm so locked into animals now you know like when those commercials come on for the animals you know they show the animal outside and they're freezing like a dog or something it's like i want to save that animal <laughs> yeah. you know if i'm going through facebook and they post an animal it's like our cat i mean jeff wayne the last cat we got jeff wayne calls me uh no, no, he hit me up on Facebook. That was it. And so I called him and he said, hey, look, I had a neighbor. She's 80. She had Alzheimer's and they had to put her in a nursing home and she's mm -hmm. all messed up in the head. And they took her cat from her and put it in a shelter. Uh, and I can't take the cat because I got a dog. Is there any chance you would take the cat? And we already were at 23. I didn't really want to take another one. But then I you're at 23. put my going to notice one more yeah it was kind of like that so i called my wife i didn't know what she would say and she said okay dude we get this cat from the shelter it could hardly stand mm. it was five pounds it looks kind of like a, a a starving cat oh. and it dude it hasn't put on any weight since we've had him we've had her i'm sorry her we've had her since january you ever tested for parasites or other stuff? We took her in. They said her blood work all came out good. I think because, you know, she she walks very gingerly. We went in and did her claws and stuff. And she could, she could hardly stand. You know how cats, they do that thing where they turn and they bathe themselves? She couldn't even bathe herself. So we had to take her in and get her groomed and they had to bathe her. I think that lady... When she once Alzheimer's hit her, I think she went a little crazy. I think that cat got thrown around and stuff, and that maybe broke some bones. I don't know, but um, anyway, that cat's been with us now since January, and uh, man, it's like I'm really glad we saved her out of the shelter because uh, she'd been in there three months and. She was, oh. when we first got her, dude, she was, she would walk around in circles on the bed for like 20 minutes before she would lay down and sleep because she was so, you know, disoriented and stuff and messed up from, yeah. oh, it was, it was, it was, it was heartbreaking to watch. And I didn't think she'd even last a month. And now we've had her for, uh, we had to put her on some heart medication because her blood work came back and he says her blood pressure is really high. 
So we put her on the medication, and took her back to the vet like a month later, and he said, she's normal now. So pretty amazing turnaround. So I'm guessing uh, 34 cats, that's going to be an expensive uh, food and litter bill. Oh, yeah, I tell my friends, I go, I had a choice between a Mercedes payment and litter and uh, cat food, and cat food and litter won. <laughs> Mercedes overrated, you know. I said most guys my age are checking their stock portfolios. I'm checking for cat food prices. <laughs> awesome, dude. So, uh, man, what else I want to ask you about? What? Uh, so, um, you also have written uh, and you've also directed, starred in, and wrote a a, a sitcom. Uh, you want to dude, that's a crazy story. That's a pretty crazy story. I, you know, I put my, I borrowed money from my mom, put eight grand of my own money in. So 15 of my mom, eight grand. Um, got it finished, shot it in, I shot 34 pages in uh, four days, got it all ready to go. My agent calls me. She's got a deal worked out with a uh, production company, and it was a black owned production company. And my agent is also black. So I call my partner, this girl, and she goes, well, I'm not giving our show over to a black production company so they can, uh, you know, recast all our actors and put in black people. Mm. And dude, I was like, you know, when you hear something and you're so stunned, you don't even have words. Well, this is your partner. You thought you know this person too. It's Dude, like well, first of all, I want to kick my own ass for not recognizing what a bonehead this person was. But now I'm like thinking to myself, oh, this is great. Not only is my partner racist, I got to call my agent who's black and tell her, oh, by the way, this isn't going to happen because, Dude, it took me three weeks to get the guts to pick up the phone and tell my agent that it wasn't going to happen. And God bless my agent. She, she's still my agent, and it, it all worked out okay. But it, I, I can't even tell you how upset and angry I was at the time. Mm. It was just like, I, dude, it was one of those times in life where you're just – you know, there's times when things happen and it upsets you and makes you mad. Then there's times when things happen and it's almost like it's almost like you don't feel like you can recover from it. It probably took me a year to get over that. Well, OK, um, so I got to share my story. I did this uh, real quick. I know that I know that you know that we're showing showing that we're disclosing our hand on horror sitcom. Uh, it, I shot this uh I met this guy 10 years, 12 years ago in New Mexico. He shot a, a, some footage for us. We were doing a, a Powell Comedy Jam all native, at an all-native tour in, in this Leta Casino. And we became friends. And you know, he said, hey, I got the script. I sent it to Brad Garrett. And he doesn't get back to me. I think it would be perfect. It was a, basically, it was a, uh, it's called Almost Americans. He wrote about a native guy that teaches citizenship to new immigrants. So we bounce it back and forth. And we do the uh, finally write the script. And he says, uh, well, we're going to shoot it. And he'll be the showrunner. And I'm going to be the star. And I'm like, I cast someone younger. Why don't we just sell it? Man? Oh, no. That's like, we'll just do it. And it turned out uh, we shot the thing, borrowed money from my college roommate. And borrow, he, he gave us the, the money. Uh, 75000 It took us three days to shoot. So I'm guessing uh, we were a little over budgeted. You managed to do it for that same price. And uh, I never saw you know, a dime. But the, the, it didn't sell. We, we had some interest in it, but he said, oh, yeah, we got gotten offered a lot of money for the script, but I told him we were doing it ourselves, which I didn't know. He kind of mentioned Oh, it. my God. Yeah, and I had a feeling. I said, yeah, I just don't think all the – we had a couple uh, uh, decent actors that had some people knew about. And so it ends up not only does the script not sell, then I find out I'm doing – he produces a New Year's Eve show in Albuquerque, and I get noted, contacted. We were working on another project. I get contacted by this guy. He said, well, we just want you to know that – so and so was off our board. Um, we had he had an un, uneasy incident with one of the females. In oh our, no! And we ran his 
background, he's on a sex offender registry list. Oh know, my God. Years, this is a, he shot, he shot a, a, a sitcom for me. He shot a, a comedy special I did. I was like, and so it was just done. I said, hey, you know, I'm sorry, we're, we're done. Oh, you don't want to do this? Nope. So, yeah, man. And then oh my I went back get a home loan. So this is, I'm screwed up for like a year, just effed up in the head. I go to get a home loan and they was, oh, we need some, ten, you had a 1099 for a corporation. Turns out it was never even incorporated. He had me, he sent me a 1099 like I was a partner. Oh my God. I kept suing and, and all. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to get anywhere going back and forth to New Mexico. And and then on top of it, the NBC, who we submitted, they came out with a, a, a citizenship class uh, sitcom. Uh, what's that one? Sunnyside or whatever about the. Yeah, the, yeah. The other Indian, uh, you know, microchip, my buffalo chip. And he, he he's like a disgraced or fallen ex congressman or, or state, re whatever. And Cal City, New York City, and he teaches citizenship to a little bit so who god knows he submitted and you see if that was a spinoff of ours and we got i got yeah. nice but you know it's just like what are you gonna do you have to pick yourself up you gotta keep going yeah that it's and it's like you go in you know with somebody you know in a perfect world he ends up working with my former partner there you go yeah right <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, and they just dupe some other people out of some money. Yeah, or they kill each other. But real quick with your partner now, you had to tell your agent we're not going to, uh, we don't want to go yeah. with the project. Yeah, so that and project, dude, that I, dude, right. I, I'm still, I'm obviously I'm not friends with that person, but uh, she still thinks I'm uh, okay with her because. I, she's one of those people. My wife sat down and said, "You know what? Don't mess with this person. This person's crazy. This is not somebody we need, you know, coming to our life." And so I, I just kind of, I sun sued her. I su dude, I sun sued her. I walked right around, and I always just come in her backside. Wow. But yeah, dude, that was like, I was. I was devastated for about a year. Then I was angry for about a year. And then, um, you know, I thought about it and I thought, okay, it did get me my agent. And um, <clears throat> so wait, wasn't the agent both your agents? No, no. And that became an issue too. We had the same manager. And then at some point when things went bad on that, uh, she talked the manager into firing me. Uh, and of course she was mad because my agent, what's this? Oh. Sorry. Um, she wanted to get with my agent too, but my agent didn't want anything to do with her. But then meanwhile, my agent signed my daughter cause my daughter's a writer. So she was, I know she was jealous about that. Mm -hmm. So, so a that didn't agent or just a, just a, Oh, no. So then I'm pretty sure she talked my manager into firing me as a F you to me because my daughter got signed by my agent. Man. So, wow. yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. But and, you know, you put in all that time and energy and then this gets screwed over. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, it's cool. I look at it like, look. I, I know I can direct direct now. I did a really good job directing it. I felt really good about that. And it got me an agent. So I try to look at the positives out of it and just you just move forward, you know? Yeah. I hear you. That's the whole thing. You know, you be in the moment. But uh, man, that was awesome. We're, we're going like an hour. I, I'm going to let you get back to the cats. Uh, okay. You really shared some great stuff. Um, definitely, if, if uh, you weren't listening when Keith uh, brought it up, I'll look into the book, 48 Laws of Power. Uh, I know when this guy uh, recommends something, uh, he's a real deal. He's not going to waste your time or my time. So uh, honored to know this guy, to call him a friend, and uh, look forward to seeing you back uh, in comedy. You did do one road gig, by the way. Yeah, I got one next week in New Mexico. <laughs> nice. Where are you going there? Las Cruces. So we'll see how that goes. All right. Well, uh, tear it up in New Mexico. Uh, keep your social distance. And... Uh, I heard chili peppers under the nostril works really well. There you go. Hey, thanks for having me on, Mark. It's a pleasure. Uh, thanks for joining me. Okay, that's uh, episode 15. How does that happen? 
Uh, I'm Mark Yaffe. When, thanks, thanks again to my guest, Keith Ross Nelson, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, buddy. Yeah.